which was um, mostly done uh, in, in MEDS with several collaborators. I'm going to show you the list of uh, major contributions to, to this research work, which led to interesting conclusions and uh, still further research. So there is uh, Professor Werner Skrotsky, Professor Tamás Ungar, uh, Professor Irene Bayerlein, Mark Hoffman from Australia, and uh, Dr. Cheng Feng Gu, Dr. Benoit Bossier, Dr. Jean-Jacques Van den Berger, Dr. Yu Dong Zhang, Dr. Yajun Zhao, Arno Pujis, as well as uh, Dr. Mandana Asagi from uh, Oran University, who were my previous uh, doctorate students. Well, METS is in France, and then uh, here I'm showing you the location. Uh, with respect to Paris, we are not in Paris, but it's uh, quite exciting to be here uh, at this point of uh, France, because here there is uh, quite much science, actually. There's a big university with 50,000 students, and we are in between two uh, nice uh, wine regions, Champagne and Alsace. And this uh, city, Metz, can be easily reached from uh, Paris uh, in one hour, 20 minutes, or from, from other cities nearby from Europe. Um, the framework of the research was mostly supported by this so-called Laboratory of Excellence, which is named DAMAS, meaning uh, Design of Alloy Metals for Low Mass Structures. So this was established the, 2012 and still uh, going on uh, in the framework of the research initiative of the French state. So it's a kind of unique, uh, specially supported laboratory. We, we are choosing this name DAMAS because it is covering very well uh, this acronym, the name of the laboratory, and also because it's about metallurgy. And in metallurgy, one of the main uh, achievement and the uh, highest material performance was achieved already uh, some time ago, 2000 years ago, by Damascus Steel. So this is why we call this uh, research laboratory Damas. Uh, we are covering in this laboratory um, the main topics of, of uh, metallurgy, including uh, metallurgy processes, uh, microstructure optimization, and uh, uh, for light weighting mostly, multi-scale modeling, and of course also characterization technique. Myself in this uh, organization, I am here mostly in the silver plastic deformation uh, area, which uh, I established in, uh, in METS, where there is a nice uh, platform doing SPD, severe plastic deformation by different means. All equipments are homemade and uh, they are under constant uh, evolution. Like there is a big uh, ECAP machine with three axes. There is asymmetric rolling. There are new processes which we established like plastic flow machining, uh, high pressure sliding, high pressure torsion of tubes, twist extrusion and so on. Well, this research is, is oriented uh, in, in order to actually to study the metallurgical development of metals uh, due to large plastic strain. And the most exciting about SPD is the grain refinement. And uh, several evidences I'm going to show here now for, for you, just by simply deforming the, the metal grain size is changing here. The deformation is large, but not very, very large. Aluminium was deformed by shear up to four. And you see the initial microstructure, which has a scale of 100 micrometer here, it locally becomes like this. So you see this is the, like this very small region here, uh, becoming very much fragmented and uh, aligned with the deformation. But we can go much further with this special technique, which I call HPTT high pressure tube twisting in which the sample is fully constrained and extremely large strains can be achieved in a very stable manner. But you can go, for example, up to 100, more than 100 shear strain. But then we arrive to a microstructure which is surprisingly does not align with the imposed shear. This is simply shear, so in this direction, we would expect that grains would be uh, elongated in that direction, but they are not so this is quite surprising why the grains do not follow anymore the impulse deformation. 
and uh, how they actually uh, behave. Well, uh, that's the, the in introduction to actually to the lecture, to the topic which I'm going to talk about. Uh, I will make, speak shortly about the role of dislocations in polycrystal deformation, about the role of geometrically necessary dislocations, especially, and uh, some modeling results on polycrystal deformation will lead us to interesting uh, relation between disorientation distributions and the geometric or necessary dislocations. So dislocations, very shortly, there are two kinds in, uh, in the formation of uh, crystals. Um, a dislocation can play the role, a so-called statistical dislocation or geometric or necessary dislocation. The same, very same dislocation can actually play the both roles. The statistical dislocations, they are and making the deformation to go on. They produce strain hardening. They do not produce significant orientation gradients in the material, but there is some kind of patterning, which is they are grouping in, into dislocation cell structures with a small up to two degrees disorientation between the different um, cells. Um, uh, on the contrary, the geometric cell dislocations, uh, they are needed to make deformation gradients possible in the material because that is needed in the material. And uh, this is why uh, these uh, uh, dislocations, the GNDs, uh, they produce orientation differences. They also pattern like uh, statistical dislocations. This is not, not that much well known, but in an early publication in 2012, they were showing that uh, by lattice curvature that actually we see this patterning. And the lattice curvature in the material, uh, these blue uh, patterning, what you see in this image, uh, they are actually due to the GNDs. So uh, we are going to focus mostly on the GND part and to see how they are related to polycrystal deformation and especially to deformation heterogeneities. Well, here I show you an interesting figure in which there are uh, uh, several information, three uh, in important ones. The function of uh, for this uh, strain, so you see from 0 0.1 to 100, which is extremely high, strain can be achieved in SPD. We, we see the uh, dislocation density, the total dislocation density varying, and you can see on the left side its value. And this is the green curve measured by uh, X-ray uh, line broadening. And uh, one can see that it is increasing. Uh, uh, and then at very, very large strains, so here, here we are in strain of 10, then it begins to decrease and going to, you know, there is a significant decrease in the total dislocation density. We will see that it is related to actually to the decrease of the GNDs. So the GND density is, is this black line and with the black circles. GND density can be measured from EBSD, actually, uh, by measuring the lattice curvature in different directions and then building up the two-dimensional uh, Nye tensor, from which with the isotopic approximation assumption, one can get the 3D Nye tensor and uh, obtain its norm, scalar norm, which is plotted here on the vertical axis. So this is the way we get actually GND density these days. Interestingly, it follows uh, somehow similar to the total dislocation density. So it, it is very large part of the dislocation density, you know, and uh, it is showing a kind of plateau at medium uh, large strains. And finally, it is going uh, down a lot and getting into a, a steady state. This steady state is very exciting actually in uh, severe plastic deformation like, because it's uh, really a it uh, doesn't change the microstructure too much. As you can see, total dislocation density constant, uh, GND density is constant, and as well as the grain size. So this blue part here, it shows for different uh, SPD testing for copper, uh, the region of uh, grain size is what one can get as a function of strain. The grain size is on the right side here in uh, nanometers, um, which is a, uh, decreasing, you know, quite rapidly as a function of strain and goes also into a saturation. So grain size 
becomes very, very small, extremely so we can speak about non-material and um, doesn't change anymore. So to understand these results, which are all experimental, uh, we are going to do some first uh, to do some modeling work of polycrystal deformation using the viscoplastic self-consistent model, the VPSC model, in the version which was established by Professor Molinari and myself in 1994. Uh, but the interesting uh, how you know to get uh, to do polycrystal deformation uh, simulations, one uh, actually can have some idea. How much is the strain heterogeneity in the material between grains? Grains do not deform in the same manner. This uh, equation here, this so-called localization equation, shows how much are the stress state differences, S minus S, uh, with respect to the strain differences here, the strain in the grain and the strain in the whole matrix, how they are related. Actually, they are related uh, by the material behavior, which is this tensor here, and by the grain shape effect, which is this other tensor. And here there is a parameter, a scalar parameter, which can scale this uh, uh, localization equation in the polycrystal behavior. Uh, by changing the alpha value, actually we can go here, you see this, look at this uh, bottom line, you can go from the static model with alpha equal zero to the tangent model, to the second model, and finally to the so-called Taylor model, uh, which is the other extreme of, of uh, polycrystal behavior. Here we have uniform deformation everywhere, and on the left side we have very heterogeneous deformation. Uh, we, it's obvious that heterogeneous deformation requires GND, so this alpha parameter somehow is in relation with the GND density. So GND density is supposed to be low here in the Taylor model and increasing uh, when the static uh, deformation mode is valid. And here this small uh, diagram shows actually that for hard and uh, weak uh, inclusions, I mean the grain in this modeling is an inclusion, this is how it is considered. Uh, they produce both, you know, GNDs, either they are hard or, or, or weaker than the average behavior. So this polycrystal modeling, VPSC, is suitable to, to model two things. Well, the stress strain response of the material, which I'm not talking about here at this moment, but also it's able to produce the textures the texture variations in the material. I speak about the crystallographic texture, so orientation distribution of the, of the grains in the polycrystal. Here I am showing some pole figures, but even if you are not expert in this field, uh, you might follow <coughs> the uh, surprisingly good uh, simulations, which can happen, you know, which one can obtain with VPSC modeling between experiment and simulation. So these four figures, they show the orientation distribution of grains. And as a function of grain size here, we have two grain sizes. We did for copper uh, rolling, which was, uh, you know, uh, coarse grain size, and also a uh, very small grain size material, which was obtained previous uh, plastic deformation. But the, the simulation result go, shows that the, uh, the Experiment can be very well reproduced by this modeling using the tangent model or the near Taylor model when the grain size is much smaller. Let's go further down to nanomaterial. Here, uh, deformation by high pressure torsion of nanopolycrystalline palladium 10% gold was uh, deformed and we studied in orientation distribution function. And the experiment in a simulation was surprisingly very nicely uh, reproduced. But under what conditions? Surprisingly, under Taylor conditions. So we went down to nanomaterial, then we obtain a behavior which is a you know, uniform deformation mode. So nanomaterial is behaving quite, quite near to uniform deformation mode, but when the grain size is large, it is not. It is behaving with very heterogeneous manner. Another example here was a rolling of nanopolycrystalline 
nickel uh, 18 percent and uh, uh, <coughs> iron and again the simulations uh, with uh, by comparing measured and uh, simulated uh, textures they showed that the Taylor model was working because this is was also again again nanomaterial so I can conclude about this polycrystal modeling that they show that deformation mode in the polycrystal is grain size dependent. For large grain size, we have the tangent model, which leads to large strain heterogeneities. For ultra fine grain sizes, we approach the near Taylor model. I didn't mention that uh, as, uh, for usual one 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 slip, we even have to add the partial slip, which is also observed in the material. In nanopolycrystal, we get uniform uh, approach in very much uniform deformation mode, the Taylor model. But we know that the grain size is decreasing uh, during large strain very rapidly first, and then it goes into a steady state. So in the steady state in the ultrafine grain region, we have a near Taylor uh, behavior of the material. Well, why these uh, stain heterogeneities disappear or uh, almost disappearing at very extremely high strains? Well, I think here we have to see that actually the GND density can be readily connected to the uh, disorientation distribution between neighboring grains. So grain boundary uh, disorientation angle frequency is shown here. Grain to grain, that's the right way to do, or pixel to pixel, which is not the right way to do. We have shown this in the publication. To get physical meaning of this uh, grain boundary orientation distribution, one has to do grain to grain analysis. Uh, well, here I show you this um, grain to grain orientation distribution you know, of, uh, of grain boundaries. We see that as a function of strain from uh, 2.4 up to 24, it's approaching very much the so-called Mackenzie distribution, which is the random one. That was for aluminium. I can show also here for copper, approximately the same, starting for lower strain, go up to extremely high large strain here, we see a nice evolution of this uh, disorientation distribution function. And uh, uh, <coughs> these are the so-called uh, grain to grain distributions, but one can also calculate the non-correlated one. That, that do not take care about that the grains are neighbors or not, disorientations can be calculated. And you see, we get another curve here. And it's uh, all, always, almost all the time is near to the Mackenzie distribution. So with what we had the idea is to take the difference between these two kinds of distributions and then uh, seeing uh, how it is correlating with the uh, actual the GND densities. The differences between the correlated uh, orientation distribution of uh, you know, uh, difference of uh, green boundaries and the non-correlated one. Uh, this is what's plotted as a third curve uh, or fourth. Actually, in this diagram I, sh I have shown, it's the red curve. And uh, you see this, this difference, this parameter is very small, meaning that there is a very good correlation with the other curve, which is here, which is a GND density. So the main finding on, on, on this part for GNDs, uh, what we found is uh, that uh, the, this uh, disorientation distribution of grains, which can be readily measured by EBSD, is correlating extremely good with the GND density. So it's even a way to obtain GND density if, if, if you would like. It also shows that uh, you know, the, the approach approaching this um, steady state and GND density is very, very low. So I'm making my conclusions on this research, uh, which is a main, in main result is that GND density is initially increasing reaches maximum and finally goes to a small saturation value. At the same time, the polycrystal behavior is approaching the Taylor mode. And, and the difference between the correlated and non-correlated distributions actually uh, are correlated very well with the GND density in the material. 
just uh, after thanking your attention, just one word about a future conference which I'm organizing in 2022 in Metz. That's the 19th International Conference on Strength of Materials. And many of you, I believe, uh, you are working on the strength of the material. So you might be interested uh, to join this conference, which I hope really will be in uh, in-person attendance. Thank you very much for your attention.